Right. Um, my start point for this paper actually was remembering a conference a number of years ago where the charge was laid that archaeologists do not read books, although that's already been refuted by John in the advance of me. Um, so, the part of, so part of the drive behind this paper is to disprove that contention, although I'm not actually talking about books about archaeology. <laughs> Science fiction was once described as stories of any kind located in any time or place, but generally avoiding the present and historically attested pasts because others were also working on stories based there. For most of us, science fiction concerns times and places not otherwise experienced by human beings. It's a literature of the imagination, although always grounded in some aspect of the human experience. It is arguably a literature that goes beyond mere actual human experience to consider what it is to be human. This is the start point for my consideration of what makes science fiction and archaeology similar. There are three dimensions along which this comparison works. One is that both are primarily written. The other is that they both concern, one way or another, issues of alterity, which is to say alternative ways of interacting with external reality. And the third is that both are as much about the present as about the past or the future. When I say that archaeology is primarily written, I simply mean that what we produce as archaeologists are written texts with accompanying images. And when I talk about alterity, I simply mean that we explore past and present life worlds mediated through material encounters which are different from those of our own, regardless if we are looking deep into prehistory, into historical periods, or into our own contemporary world. And when I refer to a concern with the present, I mean both are really about constructing models of how the world could be, deriving from that concern with alterity. Like any literary field, archaeology has its subgenres, representing the different strands of work in which those involved are engaged. And I'm going to look at three of these briefly. The past decades have seen a rising interest in the study of archaeology as a set of practices. Bruce Trigger's History of Archaeological Thought has spawned its followers, including the useful reader on histories of archaeology edited by Tim Murray and Chris Evans. Others have looked at the development of modern archaeology as a counter-argument to various alternative uses of the past. Adam Stout on the relationship of Druids, Leyliners and archaeologists in pre-war Britain, for instance, and Alain Schnapp on the correlations between Renaissance scholarship and modern archaeology. More recently, studies of what archaeologists actually do and the way we construct our understandings of the past have become evident. Uh, Matt Edgeworth's work is prominent here, especially in his monograph on acts of discovery. Others have looked at archaeology in terms of how it works as an industry, especially Paul Everill, uh, and what excavation actually does, such as Jeff Carver and Gavin Lucas. A second, slightly better established strand, is of course attempts to understand the past in its own terms, especially various aspects of past worldviews. Archaeologists have always been engaged in that, but a specific focus on social dynamics and the diversity existing within communities is a relatively new concern. Barbara Bender's work on the transition from hunter-gatherer subsistence to farming is a good example of social, on social dynamics, and so is the papers collected by Colin Renfrey, 1984, specifically under the title of Social Archaeology. These looked at communities as systems of various kinds. Others take a different perspective, such as Randall Maguire and Robert Painter's work on, archaeology, on the archaeology of inequality, which focuses directly on the social mechanisms that create the disadvantages for many. There are, of course, many more and more recent examples I could draw on, but I suspect I really shouldn't need to at TAG. <laughs> My third strand is perhaps the most recent to find a strong following. This is the literature of public and especially activist archaeology, an often politically committed, outward-facing branch of the field that engages directly with the wider world. The especially British development of an archaeology of the 20th century has opened the possibility of revisiting what we thought we knew about ourselves and using archaeology's capacity to give a voice to those who leave no trace in the documentary record to remind us of the presence of those who are silent and invisible in our own world. As Rodney Harrison and John Schofield have put it in arguing for the value of archaeology to understanding our own world, an archaeology of the contemporary past must always be a critical intervention in the present turning the lens of archaeology on our own society, especially the hidden, abject, obscured, clandestine or forgotten, whether it be the impact of militarisation on landscape and people, studies of the homeless, or to look with a new set of eyes at the familiar and ubiquitous. 
In considering and justifying our discipline, we seem to forget, if we ever realised, that archaeology began not as a narrowly self-interested pursuit, but as a contribution to public discourse about what it is to be human and what makes a good society. Periodically, this purpose of archaeology re-emerges, but it always seems to come as a surprise to practitioners. We seem to be in one such phase now, and it does us no harm to make it clear to ourselves. Science fiction literature also takes several forms and comprises a number of subgenres. I shall focus on three of these as well. So-called space opera is perhaps the most recognisable genre of science fiction writing, frequently taking humanity into the deeper recesses of the universe to encounter other life forms and environments. A classic of the genre is the Lensman series, published in the 1940s and early 50s, and the first such series to take humanity beyond the solar system. In these books, the Galactic Patrol is a kind of combined FBI, CIA and Boy Scout organisation which fights evil aliens with the help of an advanced species, although written appallingly badly, and displaying many of the uncomfortable attitudes of its period. They nonetheless make a good effort in introducing truly alien aliens rather than humans in funny costumes. Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers is also very much of this kind. Um, at a more sophisticated level are the foundation novels of Isaac Asimov, which are an attempt to turn an understanding of the fall of the Roman Empire into a deep space adventure, pitting the declining authority of the centralised galactic empire against the freebooting neoliberalism of the foundation that will replace it. Other examples include the Cities in Flight sequence of James Blish, which although concerned with the adventures of human cities that decide their fate lies beyond the Earth, are actually studies of Cold War politics and a number of other situations where humans find themselves in the future, including riding dragons to prevent alien spores from destroying Earth colonies in the Dragon Riders of Pern sequence by Anne McCaffrey. A particular favourite of mine is the culture sequence by the late Ian Ann Banks, which introduces us to a communist utopia in deep space, peopled equally by biological and artificial intelligences. In fact, there's nothing natural about the culture at all, which is why it's called the culture. Um, but which, despite its predilection towards peace, is almost constantly at war with others. His aliens are especially imaginative and different, and the, uh, the artificial intelligence spaceships very human. A second strand can perhaps be called social science fiction. This is more typically earthbound and takes current trends and extends them into the future, usually a dystopian one. Some examples have even been accused of being proper literature. The novels of John Brunner do this, his stand on Zanzibar, which is about overpopulation, The Sheep Look Up, which is about environmental degradation, and The Jagged Orbit, which is about social breakdown and interracial conflict. Brian Aldiss has definitely been accused of literature. Barefoot in the Head takes stream of consciousness writing to a new level as the protagonist narrator travels deeper into a zone literally bombed with psychotropic drugs and his consciousness fragments. J.G. Ballard we've heard of already, um, his Drowned World is a post-apocalyptic vision of global warming, while his High Rise explores the effects of modern living on human subjects. Isaac Asimov has had a go too. His science fiction detective novel, The Caves of Steel, combines a vision of an overcrowded planet with the development of intelligent robots. And Philip K. Dick asks questions about what it is to be human and the nature of memory and reality, as in the game players of Titan. And those of you who are alert and may have looked at the book list, I've changed the one I, did, I chose for him. Robert Heinlein can also be included here. Stranger in a Strange Land, which John uh, also showed, is a study of belief systems and alternative moralities, while I Will Fear No Evil and Time Enough for Love investigate the nature of identity, in particular sexual identity. A third strand is what might be called literary science fiction. These are works that draw directly on the traditions of science fiction itself, especially space opera, and reference them in various ways. Heinlein does this outrageously in The Number of the Beast, taking his characters to Edgar Rice Burroughs' fictional Mars and the Lensman universe, among others, including The Land of Oz, um, via a device that travels through all the possible universes that exist side by side. The tropes of space opera are ruthlessly exploited and undermined by Joe Haldeman in The Forever War, an exercise in counter-militarism inspired by his experience of the war in Vietnam and drawing especially on Heinlein's Starship Troopers. It's a sort of inversion of Starship Troopers. 
The deeply satirical dimension of miracles by Robert Sheckley exploits not only the tropes of space opera, but also the form of the science fiction novel itself. More sympathetic and celebratory, although no less imaginative, are the works of Brian Aldiss that take a fresh look at Mary Shelley in Frankenstein Unbound and H.G. Wells in Moreau's Other Island. A favourite of mine is Philip Jose Farmer's The Other Log of Phileas Fogg, which in the form of a historical commentary purports to reveal the real story behind Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. Here, what for Vern were social comments on the peculiar differences of French and British bourgeois culture become for Farmer anomalies that need to be explained, and they find their explanation in his story of the last phases of a pointless intergalactic conflict being fought out on 19th century Earth. Mm -hmm. These three strands of archaeological writing actually, I think, map quite effectively onto the three types of science fiction I've outlined. Writing about social archaeology const constitute historical writing in the truest sense. They tell the stories of communities as they engage with the context in which they are located. This is not unlike the narratives of space opera, which contains future histories as a subgenre. They provide a solid body of material from which to construct alternative ways of thinking about the world. Our concern with examining the origins and conduct of our discipline is not unlike the way science fiction writers play with the tropes of their own field. Both are self-referential, not to say self-reverential, and at root ask questions about what their field is for. Social commentary and criticism drive both social science fiction and much current community-based and community-led archaeology. As well as providing material for different ways of looking at the world, they act as calls to action to bring about change. As a result, the wider projects of archaeology and science fiction can be seen as broadly similar. While on the surface each concerns quite different times and places, archaeology, the actual past, science fiction, imagined times and places, both are really about the here and now, providing ways of looking at ourselves that highlight aspects of our world that otherwise we may not, or may not choose, to see. Both provide the materials for constructing models of a living that are different from our own, and thereby raise questions about how we would like things to be. And this is where my title finds its place. Christopher Priest's novel Inverted World is all about perception, especially the distorted perception of the protagonist caused by the mechanism into the service of which he was born and lives, and his ultimate choice to retain that perception even after he's shown how and why that effect has been caused. Those among us who may seek to limit our discipline to a concern with discovering truths about the past may suffer under a similar delusion about what we are for. A dose of science fiction literature may provide the chance to think again whether they choose to take advantage of it or not. Personally, I commend it to you. Thank you.